Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kristen Spindler. I'm the director of Incubator CTX and a faculty member at Concordia University, Texas. I'd like to welcome you all today to our Incubator CTX speaker series. Today, our speaker is Dr. Robert Carter, Colonel, Public Health Advisor, and Scientific Leader. We're honored to have him speak with us today, especially because it's Veterans Day. Dr. Robert Carter is a US Army Colonel and an expert in human physiology and performance. He's completed military assignments in Germany, France, Afghanistan, Washington, DC, and also at the White House under the Obama administration. He holds an academic appointment in emergency medicine at the University of Texas Health Center in San Antonio. Dr. Carter also has a doctorate in biomedical sciences and medical physiology and a master's of public health and chronic disease epidemiology. He did his postdoc work at Harvard School of Public Health, and he's served on several scientific editorial boards and has reviewed numerous scientific and medical journals. And he's also published over 100 peer reviewed articles, chapters, and reports. <laughs> Besides all that, He's the author of the book, The Morning Mind. So today he's gonna to talk with us about resilience and using your brain to master your day and supercharge your life. So again, thank you for joining us and let's give a warm virtual welcome to Dr. Robert Carter. Thank you, I really appreciate it. Most importantly, I really appreciate the warm introduction and the opportunity to speak with you today, as well as your flexibility and allowing me to talk with, with the group virtually, you know, just given, I guess, the um, my, probably a lot of the frustrations we've all experienced over the last year, year and a half in this, uh, in this, in this pandemic, this COVID environment. So I think it's, the, it's a, an appropriate topic uh, that, we, that we're talking about today is, is, the, is the concept of resilience and how that relates to our nervous system and how we can take advantage of all of the things that we currently have with us already, the toolbox so that we are living in a space of a growth mindset, a resilient mind, body, and soul so that we can achieve everything that we want to in a day and achieve our goals over our lifetime. So I just want you to take a quick look at these Time Magazine covers and just upon your initial impression of these, just think about like how these images, how these covers is, what type of mindset, what type of initial thoughts come to mind? When we hear is, is everything, is anything safe? Is anything safe? Does that put you into a, fixed mindset or our growth mindset. When we ask questions, what in the world am I do are we doing? Uh, when we think about natural disasters, hurricanes, tornadoes, climate change, are we making hurricanes worse? And so just think about what is going on. And we often ask the question, what would what would what would Abraham Lincoln do? And then what recovery I was talking with a colleague who was talking about the increase in poverty across the United States as we ensue 18 plus months of a pandemic. Now, do these things make you more hopeful or more helpless, right? And, and is it, is stress real or is it how we perceive situations? So again, many of these Time Magazine covers we may be able to relate to, but the reality is that we all have some degree of bad news that will wreak havoc or, or affect our academic, our professional growth, our personal lives, our career plans. And throughout each of these milestones in life, you know, just we all experience some degree of doubt, joy, insecurity, uh, shame, and we often feel like we're the only person experiencing those types of impacts or bad or even good news on our lives. Because even sometimes, even good news may 
be not necessarily what we would like because often we, we we're planning our lives and and you know maybe you, you've gotten accepted to graduate school or you've gotten accepted uh you know got to, to your university and you've planned and there was a university on your wish list that appeared out of nowhere and now you're like wow this is great news but the initial response at the level of the mind is to feel Oh my God, this is not what I expected because I, 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 I planned this thing for the last three or four months. I know exactly what's going on. And now you get, even though it's good news, it's thrown a wrench into your, into your plans. And so how does that make you feel? So as I'm describing that, we've all experienced that, um, that sense of, of being overwhelmed, you know, I was basically in a, in a visceral response. And when we're going through that, often, you know, we and people around us, depending on how much support we're getting and not support, when we have to make those decisions, or we often, a lot of times we ask ourselves, am I resilient? You, you know, you basically, and now we've heard a lot recently about um, brain plasticity, resilience, um, a lot of ways people now are using complementary and alternative medicine to, to improve resiliency. But we often say, you know, and that brain plasticity question is, you know, am I genetically equipped to endure these challenges and these changes that's going on in my life? So again, we really question often our ability to actually deal with these normal circumstances in life. And again, one thing you have to remember is things are constantly, everything is always changing, right? But if we're in a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset, this change that is, that is going on and we're constant, it, it appears often as chaos because we, we're, we're, we're looking at it from a fixed perspective versus if we accept that everything is constantly changing, then it really changes the perspective. And so we'll, as we talk today, I'll share some secrets with you, you know, things that reality is that you already know, you already have the tools, but sometimes putting things in perspective really can help you say, wow, you know, I thought, I thought that was the case, but, you know, I'm just not quite sure. So I'll share a few secrets with you as we talk today. So the, the bottom line is that resilience is an innate human capability, is within your capacity. Yes, it's something that we learn and develop, but the reality is that it's, 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 it's inside of us. So if you notice in my cover slide, I, talk, I scratched out the word develop. And the reason why I did that is because resilience really came from the engineering field. And what it really equates to is the maximum amount of energy per unit that some material can absorb and maintain its original position. And, some, and, and, and the amount of energy can't exceed what that material can absorb without deforming that material. So that's the concept. And in engineering, that's referred to as yield stress value. So the analogy I'll leave you with, at least in material science and physics, is that if you put a nail, for example, and you hang a picture, uh, you hang a picture on the wall, and for some period of time, you're, the, the, the nail is able to support the weight of the picture. And then one day you come home after school work and the picture is on, on the ground and the nail is no, it's no longer able to support. The reason why that happened over time is because the amount of force on the nail was uh, less than, within less than 10% of the, of the yield stress value. And over time, that stress accumulated and basically um, the picture collapsed. And, I'll, and, and I want you to I'm share that analogy and that visualization with you because we'll talk about that in the context 
of human resilience and how stress and other life events can basically push us close to our yield stress value. And since resilience is a physics and an engineering term, I want to kind of give you that context so you can uh, equate that physical problem with the problem that we have in a physical and mental context. So again, all humans have the ability to not develop, but we actually have the skills that can put you on a path of sustained resilience. And one of the individuals I had the opportunity to meet, I was very fortunate to meet, was uh, Gene Klein. Uh, Gene had uh, spent a number of years uh, in Auschwitz uh, during World War II. His family was Jewish and they were, they, they were taken away from their home. And it's basically his family found, found themselves in Auschwitz. Gene was actually fortunate to survive that, 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 that experience. And, and he accredits a lot of it to luck and having a certain mindset that he was going to survive. And one of the things that really took away from, from Gene was that it's much easier to give up than the state of course, but resilience is having the ability to overcome what many see as impossible circumstances and really feeding from the energy around you for looking for ways to survive and thrive as opposed to quitting. And so really phenomenal book. Um, I would definitely recommend it to anybody uh, that is experiencing self-doubt, um, questioning your ability to survive and thrive in any environment, because I think the principles that Gene share in his book with his daughter will give anybody hope even when they're feeling hopeless. And we'll, we'll talk more about that. So when we look at uh, what is resilience and what is not, well, when we think about resilience, it's, 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 it's not a constant state. And why do I say that? Because if we think about what is going on on a daily basis, we're oscillating or, or actually on a minute to minute or second to second basis, we're oscillating between the past, the present and the future. And when we gravitate and spend a significant portion of our time in the past, fantasizing or reflecting on how maybe how great the past was or how traumatic the past was, we're not in the present moment. And that amount of time that we spend in the past is, is the ability of our resilience. And we'll talk about our neuroplasticity that allows us to exist in the past and not becoming depressed, especially if it's, if it's a lot of trauma. Because the reason why in generally in the past, we're not really typically glorifying the past, it's more of maybe reflecting on what has happened negative in the past because the tendency of the mind when we shift and reflect to the past is to focus on a negative. And I'll talk with you some more about that if you don't believe that the tendency of the mind is to focus on a negative. I'll give you some specific examples later. And so resilience is one of those things that as I described before, everyone will experience twists and turns. And part of resilience is accepting that as the reality. It is, is accepting those, that life doesn't come with a roadmap, that it really comes with an experience of twists and turns and, and unexpected situations, then that is the first, really first step in developing or recognizing or having awareness of how resilient you are. The second aspect is really recognizing that each of those twists and turns is going to affect everybody differently. And I, a, a real example, uh, you're in a car, um, everything is going fine, everybody is experiencing the same speed, and then one person begins to look out of the window, others look as well, one person becomes motion sick. 
right? And so motion sickness is a physical and an actual cognitive component. So again, that, that change in, in just in driving is going to affect everybody. Some people are going to feel strong emotions. Why is the driver also looking that they, they may develop some anxiety on, are we going to get into an accident? So everybody in the car, and whereas one person may truly be fully enjoying the, the ocean view or whatever scene that, that the person, other person in the car basically had them point towards, they're really enjoying it. But, but throughout that experience is bringing a flood of thoughts of the past. Oh yeah, I remember that view and I grew up in Vermont, you know, with all of the leaf color changes and everything. Whereas some individual may be, um, it may bring up some tears, but each situation, even though it may be the same group, experiencing that will have a whole different host of whole host of different responses. And so the resilience aspect is that regardless of if you're um, if you're in the past or you're really enjoying that, that that you're in the present moment, which is probably gonna be a very small percentage of the people, are you thinking about the future? Resilience is the ability to really bounce back and really come back in the present moment because joy and hope it's right there with us. It's the it's in the present moment, and the aspects uh, that strengthen our ability to be resilient occur in the present moment. And I'll talk more about that when we talk about neuroplasticity and some of the ways that you can actually um, uh, unpave the roads of neuroplasticity in your brain. And so again, we often try and control. That is not being resilient. Resilient is letting go of control and understanding that things are going to happen and things are going to change. And each one of those changes are not necessarily going to give you uh, an emotion or a state of mind that you feel comfortable with. Not, not bad, it's just that it's uncomfortable for you. And resilient is that it's not the same for everybody. It means that everybody's going to experience something different. And it's like building muscle. It, takes, it, it can take some time, not so much to actually develop the resilience, but for you to tap into the self-awareness of how resilient you are. So that's the aspect that takes time and requires your own individual attention. So this basically is, it illustrates why are some people more resilient than others. And resilience is the equation, secret sauce of, of being resilient is the personal history. And that personal history starts really at, at the time that, you, that you're born. A good portion of it is between the ages of two or three to about eight, nine years old. And, and the reason why is, is that's often the first time that you experience a, a wide variety of things in life. And it's one of the, you experience those and you record those as history. Okay, yes, okay, no, yes, good, bad, don't cross the street, don't do this, do this. And you begin to basically record a mental history that is part of your, your mind. Some of those are um, experiences of, of, of love and joy, you know, having strong relationships, strong bonds with with your family, with your parents, with your caretakers. And some of those are traumatic, but they're all important for your overall resilience. Okay, often we think about just the loving and caring as being important for, for, for um, developing resilience, but it's also the, the trauma in the non-nourishing moments because um, again, uh, you would not know love if you experience lack of love. You would not know happiness if you had not experienced sadness. So both of those are opposite values and they're complementary and they're required for you to level set and develop a baseline of resilience. Uh, environment, right? So you think about those as being separate. Those is how you basically record the history, which may not necessarily be reality, but it's your own personal history. And then you have a separate piece of environment. And, and those environments basically can be uh, nourishing or maybe not nourishing, okay? And then it's the, the, the third piece of that is how you perceive. 
And, and I'll talk about stress, for example, um, is not real, but it exists. It exists because it's a component of how we perceive it. And then the final portion of that, which we often blame as, as the major portion of our resiliency, and, that, and that's a genetic piece. And reality is that it appears based on the literature, the scientific evidence that, that genetics is probably at the most 10%, and genetics mainly is governed around uh, whether you're an introvert, or extrovert, more personality. Okay, so when we think about developing resilience, uh, resilience is, again, part of the natural path of life. It's the aspect that allows us to bounce back. So I'll just share with you um, a way or to relook how you think about developing uh, resilience and really focus on the fact of saying, I am. And, and so that will get you into more of a growth mindset to say, I am resilient. I don't necessarily need to develop resilience. I am relaxed. You can do and practice tools, and I'll talk about those, on how you can practice self-awareness and how you can have, and, and again, that's going to be, begin to matriculate and manifest in having a positive outlook. And that you can choose your response. You don't necessarily have to allow your mind and your initial feelings and emotions drive your response. You have complete control over that. And you can maintain perspective, set some goals. I didn't say, you know, plan the rest of your life, but set some goals, some inch stones and milestones, and then set goals. And, and that's going to build confidence. The, the, more, the more you're able to achieve those inch stones, milli, milli, whatever, whatever units you need to basically get to that next step. And it doesn't have to be, again, it's perspective. It's, it's what's unique, unique for you to basically move along. And some of us will start off, you know, needing to just have the confidence uh, and, and the awareness and, and the mindset to get to the next hour. And then that'll lead to next, you know, four hours, the next 24 hours. And before you know it, you, 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 you've you recognized that, oh, I do have strong relationships, you know, and there are things that, that, I, that I can pull from, from my environment in order for me to basically achieve what I would like to achieve in life. And one of the things that you have to be aware of is perception. This is something you know. Often we think, ah, you know, is my, are my parents mad at me? Is my best friend mad at me? Um, and often when we talk to the person, they said, I wasn't mad. I wasn't even thinking about that. But everything and every action that they actually take, we perceive that as, just building on that, uh, on that, on that history of something is wrong, and again, that's the perception. That's the tendency of the mind to what focus on the negative, and, and again, that's so important. I continue to, to bring that you know, to bring that point up because we, we we have to understand the tendency of the mind is to focus on the negative, and remain flexible. So if you get that last minute change that you know in your best heart is the best thing for your personal life your personal growth, remain flexible and, and, and have confidence that everything is going to be okay and laugh about it. And, and when we talk about, again, neuroplasticity, we often think I have to go and do some magic. I, I need to, you know, tell me what's the magic sauce? What's the magic exercise? Is it, is it three days a week for, for, for um, 15, hour, 15 minutes or is it one day a week? Just tell me the secret sauce and, and I'll, I'll tell you the secret. The secret is any of these activities that you decide to take and engage in, if you do those in the present moment, you will develop the neuroplasticity that, that uh, you desire, and it will reinforce and continue to bring self-awareness of the resilience that bring, that are in, in you. And there, there's, a, there's a saying that, Neurons that fire together, wire together. And so it, that didn't say that you're building new wire or building new neurons. It's just that as you engage in these activities and you're in the present moment, you're, you're not um, shaming the past or getting anxious about the future. You're in the present moment. 
And so there's a saying, you know, when I socially interact, I socially interact. I don't socially interact in text. And so social interaction and being 100% with the person in front of you will strengthen relationships. To go back to the previous slide on those aspects of resilience, social interaction, 100% with that person, builds strong relationships, improve resiliency, and helps with neuroplasticity. Um, trauma is in the past. Yeah, it's, it's possible that you could experience trauma in the future, but if you're in the present moment and trauma is not happening right now, that's going to reinforce, again, spending more time in the present moment. Um, whatever emotion you're experiencing, let it come. You know, I got a slide later, I'll talk about laughter and tears, exactly the same. The outcome is stress relief, um, social interactions because people when they see you either laughing or crying it's it's an experience and, and people will experience that with you um, meditation and prayer lots of research recently mri studies that have shown enhanced neural neural connections but again present moment you're 100 so if you're exercising you're exercising well i think it's very you know so if you think about well oh, i exercised last week you probably won't have the same benefit, but we know that exercising is a present moment experience. Swimming, running, lifting weights. And that's one of the ways that people typically think about as the most effective way to, to, to uh, improve my neuroplasticity, to enhance my cognitive um, function is just to exercise. And that's one way. Nutrition, as I described before, if you're eating, you eat. You don't eat and do other things. If you're engaged in, in your math homework, your health homework, be fully 100% with it and spend some degree of time on your documenting your daily thoughts because that will help you document the benefits of what of the changes you made in your life. And that is really comes back to I am, I'm in the present moment, I'm enjoying whatever I'm doing. So neuroplasticity is, is, is really becoming more aware of how really resilient you are. And, and, and that's a list of the things that will help you document and track that aspect and really look for opportunities to grow is, is really critical. So laughter and tears, uh, let them come. So this is one that in the, in the, Western, in the Western society is um, much more socially acceptable to laugh in public and not as acceptable to cry. And often we associate um, crying with, with shame, there's something wrong, I don't want anybody to know anything's wrong with me. But the beautiful thing is that the body doesn't really care. Whether you're crying or laughing, it both, both of those are ways for emotional stress release, helps alleviate stress, helps re uh, regain balance, and releases very healthy, it's very good healthy hormonal response, oxytocin. You, you get, um, you probably have heard of the drug, drugs that, that help with serotonin reuptake inhibitors for depression, where you get some, some serotonin reuptake uh, uh, inhibition going on. And at the end, uh, often whatever resulted in the laughter or the tears or what was happening, even if you were thinking about the past or if you're really in the present moment, you find yourself, if it's really good, you're laughing and maybe you're laughing and crying, you know, at the same time, or at least, you know, within such a short period of time, you don't know which one. And then you can't even remember what was causing the stress. That's in a very effective, what I would say, uh, laughter, cry cycle. And, and the great thing is that they both burn calories. So the more time you spend laughing and, and crying, uh, well, probably maybe not too much, you can, you can help, uh, help burn, burn some calories there. And one of the last things I'll talk about is really overcoming stress and mastering setbacks. And another important concept here is that there's no such thing as being unstressed, nor would you want to be unstressed because stress, basically we talk about good stress and bad stress. I'm not sure if there's um, a, such a thing. We typically refer to exercise as being good stress and Maybe um, emotions or like work and other things that appear to be negative, 
as negative stress, but all of those are important, okay? Why? Because stress is not real, <laughs> it, but it does exist. And what I mean by that is all perspective, right? It's all perception that makes it a reality. And so when we think about what does unstress feel like and look like, it's normal breathing, normal muscle tension, not a lot of tension in the neck muscles, less pain because generally you probably will have some degree of pain, uh, better sleeping, appetite interest, uh, ap uh, interest in pleasurable things, and really awareness of stress and how life changes are impacting you. Remember I described before, you got to remain flexible. You can't avoid life, but having that awareness of how stress, like you say, wow, today was really, um, really a rough day. I really feel tired. That's good. That's good. You, you know, you want to have that awareness. Lack of awareness is, uh, is, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's, uh, it's been a long day and you've been in a lot of meetings. You're, you're an introvert and you go home and you work more and not having that awareness that, wow, that was a tough day. That's where you don't want to be. And, and, I, and I talk about that because we often lack the awareness of how the activities are affecting us from a cognitive perspective. Physical, we know when we've gone out and ran you know, 10 miles and we haven't done that in a while, we're gonna feel it. Our body's gonna let us know. If we go to the gym and we haven't been there in a while, and we go you know, lift weights, or we go do some yoga, or we go do some stretching, we're going to feel it. Our body is going to basically give us a nice signal um, in the form of pain, but that pain, stress, or overstimulation doesn't always happen um, in the brain when it involves cognitive activities. Stress, when we think about the brain basically is well-equipped. You know, humans evolved you know, with, with stress, right? But if you go back to that initial discussion that we had of that yield stress value, when we begin to experience and exceed that, that's when we're more susceptible to fall into depression and other chronic, um, both mental and physical problems. So again, having awareness of when we are in this uh, sustained state of, of, I would say, negative, the negative mindset in the past, it's just really good, you know, to, uh, to have that awareness. And uh, as I described before, the body and, and the brain are well equipped to help you deal with stress. And the brain aspect is basically help to help you put everything in perspective so that you can get through that day and get through many more days in the future. And the last point I, I would like, like to make is um, facing fear. And, I, and I'll share another, another last story with you. Um, as a young officer in the military, I, um, I was always afraid of, afraid, afraid of heights. Um, and I had an opportunity probably almost 20 years ago to go to airborne school. What that is, is you go down to Fort Benning, in Georgia, and you basically learn how to jump out of a perfectly, perfectly good airplane. And I convinced myself uh, I'm going to do it. And so I um, went down and bottom line is I, I survived. I'm still here. Parachute opened successfully. And uh, I thought, yeah, this is great. I'm going to overcome my fear of heights. And I did actually, but it opened up so much more. Um, again, in aspects of life that I, I would say, unknown fears or fears that I, that I did not want to face, just basically attacking some of the simple fears that you're willing to actually take on can really open that door to a path of awareness of your resistance, of your, no, your, yeah, some, some resistance, but really uh, how resilient you are. And, 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 and again, you don't have to take on your most challenging, you know, maybe traumatic situations from the past, you can take on you know, things that you feel more comfortable with. And what that's going to do is really put you on a pathway of, 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 of healing and a path of better, better awareness of your resilience, because it's there with you. And, and I'll share a quote with you with, from, uh, from, from Dale Carnegie, 
uh, who uh, who many of you may may be aware of. And, And he wrote, do the thing you fear to do and keep doing it. It is the quickest and surest way yet discovered to conquer fear. Expose yourself slowly to your fear. Again, slowly is the key. You do not need to do it all at once, but don't quit. And that's the key. And, and I will leave you with that, um, with that quote, because really vice is fear mastering your life. You need to use your fear as an advantage. And all of us can, can actually do it. And again, if you're not willing to do it, just fake it. You know, you can create something you're afraid of and attack it. And then the things that you're most afraid of will actually um, float to the top and you'll be able to master those. But again, thanks for the opportunity and for um, all the veterans out there, active duty. Just want to thank you for your service. And uh, family members, you know, thank you for your service as well um, to supporting uh, your veterans and loved ones. But uh, I'm going to stop there so we have time for questions. Great. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Carter. Um, we do have a couple questions in the chat. So the first one um, is from Julia, and she says, it's Veterans Day. Can you talk a little bit about your engagement ex- and experiences while working with veterans? Yes, yes, no, for sure. Um, so I've worked now with veterans for directly. I mean, I've obviously I've been military um, uh, since 1997 uh, with a break in there for graduate school. But um, I would say working with veterans and I'll, I'll, I'll contextualize it and definitely if I missed a question or I don't fully answer something that she would like, I'll definitely attack it. But I worked with an organization called Project Welcome Home Troops, an organization that really was focused, is focused on um, more of, you know, I would say resiliency building, or, or really, I think it's, you know, resiliency, uh, bringing awareness uh, to resiliency, um, and focusing a lot of fo- with folks that have been primarily in post-traumatic stress, or have been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress, anxiety, um, hypervigilance, and um, that the population, as a, as I mentioned before, some of the things we talked about are some of the the points that we bring up actually on that course, and it's a phenomenal experience. And some magic actually happens when 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 we talk about like points I'm, I brought up before, like the tendency of the mind is to focus on the negative, and and, and so much trauma and depression or basically uh, uh, loss of self-confidence, a lot of things that can, that can occur with some individuals with combat, basically just by uttering those words and thinking about it in a different way can bring, bring a significant amount of healing. I've worked now, you know, taught workshops on uh, stress management, um, breath-based meditation to, uh, to, to probably a thousand vets, so with, with my wife. Great, thank you. So our next question is from Madeline and she asks, do you think it is more important to reduce the sources of stress in your life, such as extra projects, or to try to change our perception of them? How do you determine when you need to lighten your schedule versus when you need to change your mindset? Yeah, no, it's a balance. And 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 I'll tell you, uh, the mindset and perception is, is critical. Obviously, you know, as you, basically and yeah i mean that that is that is something that that is critical it is to change your perception and at the same time manage your workload and the reason why it's important and obviously we all have 24 hours in a day and what happens normally when you change your mindset certain things that were hard and difficult they become they just require more energy so if you think about everything is really energy management and so um it's uh, and so the tendency, okay, now I can take on more. And the reason why I say doing both, but really the mindset and, 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 and uh, perception of everything you're doing, and the things that as you change your mindset, some of the things are gonna naturally fall off the plate because you're gonna say, huh, you know, I was placing a lot of value in, in doing that, but 
that is not really where I want to spend my time. So some things will naturally fall off once you change your mind, mindset and your perspective. And maybe you said, yeah, I'm, I was working on, you know, fostering a relationship with, you know, with, you know, friends, family, whatever. And no, nah, that's really not where I need to spend my time. So that will happen. Regulating the intake is also important. So I described before, you're going to have twists and turns that's going to add things to your plate. You know, I was talking with a colleague and um, his mother passed away and he wasn't expecting to have to take care of his father, but now he has to um, drive to California, get his dad, sell his dad's, you know, his parents' place, his dad's place. And, and those type of things, you got to plan, uh, I would say, some emergency resilience. <laughs> you, you can't tap all, in, all, all into it at once. You got to save um, some space for, you know, emergency reserve fund, federal reserve. Great. Um, so we have another question here um, from Tiana. And I, I think the gist of it is that sometimes hardships, uh, looking back, they bring us strength, um, but maybe at the time they bring us sorrows. So what what is, you know, what's the difference in perspective? Yeah. Yeah, no, and that, that's a great question. And I'll tell you, um, that's why it's so important not to, um, or, or at least to be awareness of how we're judging, you know, things that are happening. It's so easy to, to, uh, to sit there like at the coffee shop, you know, the coffee shop of your mind and everything that happens in your life, you're judging it. You know, you're, you're just constantly, you know, you, see it and then you spend some time because the reality is that how you see it right now at this moment um, will either be as a positive thing or a negative thing in the past because it's, it's all going to the past everything that's happening right this moment is going to be in the past it doesn't matter if it's five years in the past second in the past it has passed and so that is important you know you know to basically know and that's another good point is that to know that how you see something right at this moment is, is going to be different. It, you know, and it's not going to be the same because new information will arrive and you say, oh, well, you know, the way I thought about that was completely wrong. So don't waste your energy basically judging. And, and again, having that awareness, yes, we're going to still judge, but having awareness that I am judging, you know, it will actually is part of that that growth mindset is to have the awareness, you know, of how your brain is functioning at that moment. Great. Um, the next question is about social media. So what about stress or fears that are created virtually on social media? How do positive or negative tweets affect your resilience and what can you do to protect yourself? Yeah. Well, first of all is to, uh, you know, if you're interested in a topic, um, do your own research. If it's something that's important to you, you know, something that's really evoking anxiety and fear, you know, like avoid it, <laughs> you know? So, so I have a daughter and she, uh, she, uh, she's like, oh, let's look up zombies. She's terrified of zombies. So I'm like, why are we going to go look zombies up so you can be terrified? And so I use that analogy just because, you know, if, uh, if your number one thing you worry about is, you know, financial future you know you're going to retire or you're you know trying to save for the future and you you have three apps to watch the stock market every five minutes is that good or bad for you it's bad actually find something that you're less interested in because it's less likely to be invoking fear how much control do you have over the stock market if you look at your app you know every five minutes zero right and so so part of it is that you have to basically you have to be aware of the things that's going to cause anxiety, meaning things that you're worried about in the future and things that's going to trigger depression and traumatic events. And so um, that's how you manage it. You, 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 you stay away from things that's going to, it goes back to that environment. Social media, the internet is an environment. If we go back to resilience, is, is, is putting yourself in situations that's going to either physical or virtually going to help your resilience or not, right? Is it going to give you more neuroplasticity or not? So that should be the question that you're asking. You know, um, not how should I manage it, but of the aspects that we know that's important for your, um, your growth, your growth mindset, your neuroplasticity, 
your, your resilience. Is this helping or hurting those three things? And if it's, it's hurting, you stay away from it. So I don't say stay away from social media, stay away from social media that's not helping you. Great. So um, you were talking um, about your daughter. How would you explain resilience to a child or an adolescent? Yeah, no, no, that, that, that's a great question. And, 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 uh, and part of it, you know, it's, it's amazing, actually, that is the right time uh, to, uh, to talk. And you know, in fact, I had a conversation with my daughter. Um, I think my, my wife has been very worried about this, but um, she was at school, right? And since she was in pre-K, we've been talking about bullying, right? So bullying is a great way to talk about resilience because bullying didn't exist, at least in Southwest Louisiana, where I grew up, it didn't exist. You know, it was part of basically either you, you know, basically develop or recognize ways to basically manage and keep yourself out of situations, but it is a real thing now and kids are taught about it. So it's a, it's a word that exists in, in their mind. So, um, so we were talking about like making friends. So we just moved, um, well, we moved from Florida to Texas and she uh, was having kind of a difficulty kind of making new friends. And so we, we talked about basically how building relationships, you know, yes, new people and ways of doing that. And she said, well, nobody wants to play with me. And we talked about basically what does that actually mean? And, 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 then, uh, and then her role in the fear and, you know, how animals basically, or humans or animals can sense fear. And, and, and we talked a lot about, you know, like that whole stress response and using words that, that she could understand. But I think, you know, bullying and, and, and that aspect is a great way. Um, Cyberbullying, you know, and, and again, kids get on the internet earlier and earlier and to talk about what that means. And like t we, we use the zombie as another one, right? What are you afraid of? You know, um, uh, zombies. Yes. Well, should we watch movies about zombies? No. Well, OK, this is why. And so there are lots of opportunities. And that's where, you know, kids are taking in some of this information. And it's just about really, really having a time with to spend with them to talk about, you know, what is all this information actually uh, go in and why it's so important not to just look at exactly what's going on now but but it is difficult because there's only uh there's only two times and I learned this from from a colleague when I was traveling to Africa he said there's only two times that that kids know and there's only really two times people in developing countries often know and that is now and not right now we, we have the only concept of you know that's in between that is either now or not right now and so with kids it's very clear you know I want candy uh you can have it later that basically is not right now. And then if you get it, it's now. <laughs> and so you got to put that in the context of the discussion as well. Great. Um, Dr. Carter, you have a new book that you're working on. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah. So um, in the morning mind, um, we, we spent some time really talking about, you know, basic concepts that I think would be important for people to be successful. And uh after a series of interviews and thoughts and really just thinking about what was next, um, decided to really focus uh, the discussion on more in-depth discussion on, in, on, this, on how the circadian rhythm um, uh, impacts our overall physiology and our ability. And it's, it's really beyond the morning, you know, midday, night, that whole 24 hour period is really critical for mastering the day. More than 100% is critical. And so, so this next book really is focusing on how we can take full advantage of that 24-hour cycle uh, with the combination of, you know, questions, you know, should I do yoga in the morning or is it better end of the day? You know, should I, um, should I eat, you know, like one, you know, I heard, you know, like there's, there's a few famous people that said, I only eat one time a day, you know, and, 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 and thinking through the physiology and, and, and of, of, of eating one time a day. So, and, and so, yeah, this book really is going to really open up and provide, I think, you know, some of the top questions that are out there that if you follow social media or you follow your latest journalists, <laughs> they, uh, they talk about, you know, these things that realistically are not necessarily, you know, based in good science and not really well thought out. So I think the morning mind and success that we, have with the morning mind. Um, I think 
everything I've heard, it, it, it's because it was evidence-based and we wrote it from a perspective where it, it made sense. And it's been now translated in six languages, you know, plus English. And so that's the idea. I realized that, that there's a, a, a true need to actually have um, uh, those intriguing questions, but actually kind of laying them out in a way that first of all, you explain, and then you actually give, give solutions. And so it's not just, you know, the theory and everything, but really saying, okay, yeah. And then not saying everybody's wrong. That's the other key, key piece. Not saying, oh, this is all wrong, you know, take my diet, but it's really providing solutions that is actionable, you know, without having to do a lot of work. Like a, talk about mindful eating. Like so, when you're eating, eat, <laughs> you know, and not not text, look at TV, and everything else. And so we talk about the benefits of doing those type of things over a 24 hour period. Great. So, how long does it take to internalize these new habits? Um, as long as you, as long, and there's really no no time, right? You know, it's um, I always say it depends on where you are. You know, you know, everybody's in a different place. Um, uh, and every, we all need a little bit more work, you know, I mean, it, it ranges, right? So, so, um, and, and, and that's one of the things we actually do is, uh, in this next book is actually provide, I would say an assessment, you know, you know, of physically where you are, you know, emotionally where you are and spiritually where you are, and then you get, you know, magic number, and then you kind of can start from where you are. And I think that's one of the the, I think one of the things we attempt to do in the, in the morning mind, but I think we we're doing better in this next book because that was another aspect. Is you know like how do I you know where do I start? And so thinking through, yeah, you know everybody is working on a different aspect within those three buckets, you know, in a general sense. And so um, kind of depending on where you are, you know, and what you want to work on first, if time management, you know, um, is your issue. Um, you should work on time management. You know, you shouldn't work on, oh, well, I need to do more mindful eating. You know, if physical activity, if you're worried every day, you know, I, I, I have a good friend who's, is, is uh, uh, most males in his family, you know, had a heart attack or a stroke by the age of 50. He's 44. And, and every day he's stressed out, am I going to have a heart attack or a stroke? And so I said, you need to work on basically reducing any type of risk factor that's going to result and not so much you having a stroke or a heart attack, <laughs> but the, 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 the mental load. I said, probably what killed, you know, the males in your family was just the worry, right? Each person was worried about, you know, what happened in the past with the previous folks. And so it, I, I mentioned that is because, you know, each person is going to start in a different place, but you really have to assess. But most importantly, you got to start um, maybe not aggressively. You can ease into it but you got to focus on what is the true source of your stress. The thing that, what is the thing you think about the most? You can say, well, you know, I really want to, you know, lose, you know, lose a few pounds. And, and, and all day, uh, at least periodically, you think about I need to lose. And, 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 and losing five pounds is the thing that really puts you in a depressive mindset in the past. Oh, yes, I remember when I was 102 pounds and now I'm 130. You know, it, 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 whatever, whatever that thing is, that's the thing you got to address because you know, and that is not the easiest thing, but you gradually, you know, get into it. But that's why I talk about, you know, the thing that is not good is for you to go and, uh, and try and do some crash diet. And, and so that's the aspect that by easing into it, you, you can see those, you can make those small wins. Cause often if you just jump too deep in, into making change, you tend to fail. So it's really modifying lifestyle and then adding from there. Okay, so we have one last question, um, which is, who are some people you've looked up to over the years, and what values have they instilled in you to continue to grow instead of giving in? Yeah, yeah, no, no, for sure. And, I, you know, I'm, I, I really like history. And, uh, and so th there's been a number of folks, you know, for, for different, different reasons, like for whether it's spiritual, whether it's you know, physical, or whether it's, uh, you know, more, more, more mental. And, and I'll give you, you know, for, for one, uh, from a spiritual perspective, um, there is, um, uh, he was from uh, New Jersey, father, uh, son, son of, a, of a minister and, uh, and uh, was, was a Rhodes Scholar, um, Paul Robinson. 
Um, uh, probably not known to a lot of people, but Paul Robeson was one of the people I really, as a young kid, said, wow, you know, if I could just have like 10 or 15% you know, Paul Robinson, and uh, he, he was probably dead, you know, at least a decade, I mean, a century before I was born, but I ran across the book, and, and he, from a spiritual perspective, you know, Paul Robinson really was, was someone that I really, really looked up to, and then um, um, I, I, uh, I was afforded me to run her in school, and I, you know, looked, looked up to just the, um, the, uh, the mental, know-how and a work ethic of, of uh of, of michael jordan you know because i was you know it was one of those things I, I wasn't a basketball player but just when he talked about like the amount of dedication that it really took you know to actually to actually do that um i had a chance um i was in the car earlier with my wife and i had a chance to to work both for um uh, Pre president uh, bush and, and president obama and um from an over total person, both of those individuals more recently had a profound impact. Because often we see like, you know, the, you know, what, what politicians are, 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 are doing on, on the surface. And what we don't see is the, the amount of care and love that each one of those, at least those two individuals, that, that, you know, each individual focus, President Bush was heavily focused on, at the, obviously at the time we had the war, he's really focused on meeting with families that lost loved ones. But the care and compassion that went into each one of those was just, you know, undescribable. And then similar like type things that President Obama engaged in as well. Um, and then uh, a book that I've been working on for some time, a historical figure um, by the name of Robert Carter III, uh, no relation to me. Uh, Robert Carter III was a, he's known as the great uh, first emancipator um, from, from Virginia, um, Southern Virginia, um, family owned some 146 plantations. Um, at, at the age of seven or eight, Carter inherited uh, 500 uh, slaves. And, I'll, 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 and over his lifetime, he, uh, he was really the first emancipator. Um, Carter influenced, uh, he was uh, one of the founding fathers, but, for, for, um, but what he was doing in the 1700s wasn't appreciated. He loaned money to Thomas Jefferson, uh, was friends with all of our other founding fathers, and, uh, and really is credited with the, with the phrase of all men are created equal, and, uh, and ensured through his resources that uh, many of the things that he could not accomplish in his lifetime, and many of us are completely unaware of Robert Carter III, the, the, the great emancipator, um, he, uh, his, um, his work and his efforts 250, 300 years ago, continue to impact us today. And like I said, it's just amazing. Um, I wasn't named after him, discovered him many years uh, later in life, and uh, just a really an amazing story. And I'm actually working on, on a leadership book, basically um, doing a, uh, an assessment of the leadership qualities and principles that made Robert Carter III, uh, uh, who he was and how he really shaped the, uh, the uh, Emancipation Proclamation and the Constitution and our Declaration of Independence. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us today, Dr. Carter, and for telling us all about resilience. It's going to be super important for all of us as we head into the holidays, uh, final exams, and, and all the things that everybody has to do here. Uh, before the end of the year. So um, great time to be talking about this. Um, and again, thank you. Happy Veterans Day. And to all of those who have joined us today on the call, um, we appreciate you. Um, and Lauren and Ryan, we also appreciate you too for your help uh, behind the scenes making this all possible today. So again, everybody have a great afternoon um, and thank you. Thank you. Again, thanks for the invitation. and. Uh... And, and look forward to talking with you again soon.